Well, good morning, Walden Church. My name is David Kenny, and I'm the pastor here. And today, I would like to talk to you about holiness. That's right, holiness. Um, I think we should preach about holiness more. I do. I don't know that as a church, as a global church, we, we preach about holiness enough. And I think at first, when I had the idea to preach on holiness, my first thought was, I'm not, I'm not worthy. I mean, who am I to preach about holiness? I'm sure some of you who are even watching right now are thinking, I've, I've been a Christian longer than you. Maybe you've even been a Christian longer than I've been alive. I'm sure that's true. But I think that you and I spend time in our walk where we don't feel holy, right? We don't feel especially holy. And we probably then should preach on holiness more. But I think we don't because of the picture that holiness puts in our heads. Because when I think of somebody as being holy, right, I kind of also associate that with arrogance or, or the holy rollers. Or we think of the Pharisees, right, who wanted to look holy. They wanted people to think of them as holy. Or we think of the phrase, holier than thou, but that's wrong. That is not what holiness is or what it looks like. Holiness is not perfection. Holiness is not pride. Holiness is not arrogance. In fact, as a child of God, I should want more holiness in my life. I should want more of the Holy Spirit in my life. I should be pursuing holiness, not running away from it. I should want holiness. When I think about holiness, it should make me excited. It should be the motivator for everything I do. You know, we talked about reading and studying the Bible for two weeks. Why? Why, why on earth would you want to read your Bible? To be more holy. You know, we said there was, what, 613 commands in the Bible? You know, when you read those commands and you study those commands, it's incredible how many of them are commands about holiness. Do this and you'll be holy. Steps to becoming holy. So I want to talk about the whole in our holiness. There's a gap, I think. There's a gap between what the world tells me to pursue and the holiness of Jesus. I think the world has a hold on all of us. And the I think for all of us, I think the world's message is more important to us. Media and the world's message are changing us and we are slowly being conformed to the world. Even though the Bible says that's the wrong way to go. I know we probably have a lot of boomers watching this, right? The boomer generation. I'm known as the Gen X generation. Gen Xers are self-sufficient. They are resourceful. They're individualistic. They were accustomed to caring for themselves long before adulthood. They value freedom, responsibility. They try to overcome challenges by themselves. Gen Xers value diversity and self-reliance and practicality and informality, the balance of work and play, flexibility and technology. You might be a Gen Xer. You might be a Gen Xer if you remember spending afternoons riding your bike with friends and coming home when the lights came on. It was normal for a Gen Xer to tie up the phone line for three hours. If you're a Gen Xer, you know what a record store is. You know what a mixtape is. You probably even remember making a mixtape yourself. You identify with the word slacker even though you are an upstanding citizen who has a good job. Your first email address was probably an AOL address, and you remember how old you were and when you got it. If you're a Gen Xer and you walk by a store window and you see a pair of Doc Martens hanging there, you think to yourself, I think I want those. <laughs> you know that the movie Heathers was the original Mean Girls. Thursday nights on NBC were must-see TV, and you never missed it. I was heavily influenced by my generation. You can probably relate. 
I was heavily influenced by my culture. Probably more so than any pastor, probably more so than the Bible. So we're talking about the whole that's in our holiness. Because I don't think it's just me. I don't. I think we all need a great culture shift in our life. And we need to leave behind that generational identity. I think we need to rediscover our spiritual identity. In the world, I think it's, it's, it's really easy for us to get passionate about a lot of things. You know, things we all think are important. We think politics are important. We think wealth is important. Or we think activism, raising awareness is important. Making a difference. But what about holiness? And if holiness isn't in your top 10, then how do you fill that hole? How do you fill the hole of holiness? So let's talk. Let's talk about holiness. Let's talk about how we should pursue it. Maybe why we should be excited about it. I'm going to read Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I want you to find it. I want you to put your finger on it because we are going to go back to it again and again and again. Paul writes, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. All right? Keep your finger there. We're going to come back to that verse a lot. You know, we talked about Bible study last week, and uh, a good rule keep in your head for Bible study is whenever you see the word therefore, you should always discover what it is there for. What does the word therefore mean? It means for that reason. For that reason. For that reason what? Be holy. Why? What was the reason? Well, this is the first verse of chapter 12. So to find the reason, you got to go back a chapter, right? You got to go back to Romans 11. Romans 11 says, as regards the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. For just as you were at one time disobedient to God, but now have received mercy because of their disobedience, so they too have been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they also may now receive mercy. For God has consigned all to obedience that he may have mercy on all. What's the reason? Was it, was it a little confusing? <laughs> he says a Gentile is now on the inside. A Gentile who is on the outside is now in. A Gentile who is hated is now beloved. A Gentile who is under judgment is now under mercy. And Paul says, for that reason, be holy. For that reason, be holy. In other words, become who you are. Become who you are. You are no longer a Gentile. You are no longer a Gen Xer. You are no longer a boomer. You are a member of that church. For that reason, be holy. You are now an adopted son or daughter of God. For that reason, be holy. You have been sanctified. You have been washed clean of your sin. For that reason, be holy. You are a royal nation. You are a holy priesthood. For that reason, be holy. Holiness is not about you becoming something you are not. It's about becoming who you are. The world wants to tell you who you are. People are arguing everywhere. You need to accept me. This is the way I am. This is who I am. I was born this way. But God says, no, you're mine. You are mine. You are an heir. You are a recipient. You are holy. Verse 1 says again, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Notice, that passage says, of God and to God. So I think when you read that, of course, you are led to believe that holiness is about God. Holiness is about God. Paul said it's because of the mercies of God. Why do you need to be shown mercy? Sin, 
right? You're a sinner. We were all sinners because of your sin, yours and mine. Again, again, maybe you're like me. Maybe you're like me. Whenever I sin, whenever I mess up and I have to look myself in the mirror, I say, I, I should have been better than that. I should have known better than that. I was so stupid to do that. Why did I do that? I have not lived up to who I should be. And I think that sin is an affront to myself. No, that's wrong. My sin is an affront to God. I have not wronged myself. I have wronged God. But see, the good news is God doesn't want my perfection. Holiness is, a, is not about perfection. God does not want my perfection. He wants my obedience. So he becomes the reason. He becomes the motivation for my holiness. I want to be holy for him. Holiness is about God. Arrogance, arrogance is when I want holiness for myself, for my well-being, or how it'll make me look. But true holiness is about God. Romans 12.1 says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Here's something I think that a lot of us get wrong. I think we kind of know it. We kind of have the right theology, but we get it wrong. Holiness takes effort. It does. It takes effort. Yes. We are who we are, yes, by his grace, without works, absolutely. But does that mean that works or anyone who preaches works is wrong? No, because this says, present yourself as a living sacrifice. So it sounds like we have to do something, right? We have to do something. So holiness takes effort. Listen. It is not wrong to try. It is not wrong to try. It is not wrong to put in effort. In fact, the Bible is full of verses about the pursuit of holiness. Romans 8 says, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if, the, but if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body. Ephesians 4 says, To put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life. Colossians 3 says, Put to death. Therefore, what is earthly in you? 1 Timothy 6 says, Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life. Luke 13 says, Strive to enter through the narrow door. 1 Corinthians 9 says, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run? 2 Peter 1 says, For this reason, make every effort. Colossians 1 says, For this I toil, struggling. Christian holiness takes effort. It takes perseverance. You have to try. It does not come naturally. It does not come easy. It is not the path that everybody around you is taking. You are certainly going upstream. See, we think holiness is some sort of attitude or this divine state of being. And, you know, we walk around and then we just glow with a little golden halo, and then it means you never sin. Holiness doesn't mean you don't sin. Holiness does not mean that you're perfect. It just means you are walking the path. You are moving toward God. Romans 12 says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do you ever think that God looks at you, sees your sin, and pff, is disgusted? Looks at you as a screw-up. Looks at you and says, Bleh, there they go again. And God's just impossible to please. Is that why you are afraid to try? because you'll never get it right? You think it's impossible? See, Paul says, you are holy and acceptable to God. 
That means when you take steps towards him, he is pleased. When you take steps towards him, he is pleased. Any effort, any, any little bit of effort, any effort, you don't have to be perfect, just obedient. How do I know? How do I know? Because God refers to himself as your heavenly father. Think of your own parents. Think of your own childhood. When you were a baby, you had days when you were just learning to stand, days when you were just learning to walk. And on one of those days when you took a couple steps and you fell and your parents were watching you learn, do you think when you took those couple of steps and you fell, they were like, I can't believe it, what a loser. You think your parents were disgusted because you fell down? Ugh, they can't walk. No, your parents celebrated those two steps and they ran to you and picked you up and applauded your effort. Your heavenly father is no different. Your heavenly father is not disgusted with you. He's someone who rushes to you, encourages you, picks you up, who consoles you, encourages you, loves you. You won't ever be motivated to be holy if you think that God is impossible to please. When you take any steps towards him, when you put in any effort, he is pleased. Romans 12.1 says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. What is that? What is that word at the end, spiritual worship? What is that? Because worship, we know, right? Worship, worship sounds like church. Worship, worship sounds like temple. Worship sounds like singing. Sounds like the sacrifices. But here, what Paul's actually uh, using is he's using another word for logic. Logic. He says, holiness is the logical way to be. It's the logical way to be. We talked about translation last week, right? We talked about how there's different ways of interpreting the same words. And we said one of those ways is a thought-for-thought -thought translation. If you look at a thought-for-thought -thought translation, one Bible says, considering what he has done, it is only right that you should worship him in this way. It's logical. Another says, when you think of what he has done for you, is this too much to ask? In other words, Paul is saying, in light of what I have just said, this is the logical way to worship. The logical way to serve, the logical way to sing. In light of what I have just said, you should walk in the light. In light of what I have just said, you should live holy. God dwells in holiness. Yes? God dwells in heaven. And in heaven, there is only holiness. There is no sin. That was represented in the Old Testament. God lived in a room called the Holy of Holies. It was in a temple that was already holy, but then in a smaller room that was the holiest place. And now, nowadays, you and I, since the cross, the church now is no longer a temple of brick and wood. The temple is now a temple of flesh and blood. We are the church. The church is, not, church is not a building. We are the church. We are the place where God dwells. We are the new place God dwells. Revelation says one day there will be a new heaven and a new earth, and at the end, God will come down to the new earth and live with us. God's dwelling place will be with us, and where God dwells should be a holy place. That is logical, yes? So if God dwells in us, then we should be holy. If God dwells in us, we should be holy. Why pursue holiness? It's logical. It's how it should be. Verse two, Romans chapter 12, verse one and two. I appeal to you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. What does verse two say? It says holiness will never look like the world. 
You don't have to be confused. Holiness will never look like the world. The world will try to make sin look normal. The world is going to try to make sin look normal and righteousness look strange. There are no worldly cheerleaders on the path to godliness. Our culture will always champion sin and darkness and the world will always be at odds with God. So how do you know if you're on the path to holiness? Put it to the test. Put it to the test. When you watch the news, when you watch TikTok, when you watch Facebook, when you listen to popular music, when you watch popular TV shows or popular movies, does it send a shiver down your spine? Do you feel uneasy? Or do you feel nothing? You're just numb to it. Are you fine with it? In other words, does the message of the world feel off or normal? Paul says, do not be conformed to this world. The world and holiness, they are at odds with each other. The world's message should make you feel uncomfortable. Always. And if you are numb to it, then unplug. Try it. Try an experiment. Unplug. Stop watching the news. Stop reading the news. Stop reading the paper. Stop being active on social media. Get off Facebook. Get off YouTube. Unplug. Cut off the world. And take that time and jump into the scriptures. Take that time and jump into worship and serving. Unplug from the world and plug into God. And if my telling you that makes you uncomfortable, you're like, I don't know if I want to do that. Well, there's your first clue that the world may already have its claws in you. Going on a media fast, I know. It sounds boring, it sounds dull. Try it for a week. Try it for a week and see if you don't experience culture shock. Paul says, do not be conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewal of your mind. How do you do that? How do you renew your mind? Same way you hard reset your computer or hard reset your phone. You turn everything off and you reboot. Holiness will never look like the world. So you have to maintain a measure of distance from the world. And you have to pursue a renewal of your mind. Romans says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. You want to be holy? Why? Why do you want to be holy? Paul tells you right there, holiness leads you to God's will. That little bit of effort, holiness leads you to God's will. Holiness should make me want to get rid of all the things of this world and to choose the path that leads to God. And then I'm going to fill my life with all of those good things, all of those acceptable things, all of those perfect things. If I am pursuing holiness, then when I get to one of those tough decisions, when I get to one of those forks in the road that goes left or right, and I say, which way should I go? If I am pursuing holiness, I will recognize the will of God, and I will choose the right path. Because holiness is always going to lead to something good. Holiness is always going to lead me to his peace. If you feel anxious and nervous and worried all of the time, guess what? Holiness is good. Holiness is good because God knows you. 
God knows you and he knows what's best for you because he's your heavenly father. And when you trust him, even if it's going against what worldly wisdom says, the world says this, oh, you got to do this because that's the right thing. You, you can rest assured that if you pursue the will of God, it's going to be good. It's going to be the best. And if you feel desperate, if you feel lost, if you feel alone, then what are you clinging to for hope? It's either going to be the world or God. Don't you want to be living in his will? Don't you want to know his will? Then then you better white-knuckle grip Jesus for all he's worth in all things. Only in pursuance of holiness are you going to make it. Especially if you want to escape the crushing blows of the enemy. All he wants to do is steal what is good in your life. All he wants to do is destroy your family. All he wants to do is make you sad and poor and ignorant. And if you're desperate to get away from all of that, then throw yourself at Jesus and never look back. Hebrews 12 says, Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Remember I said the Lord lives in holiness. Yes, he lives in holiness. The author of Hebrews says, then you need to be pursuing holiness if you want to see him. Because that's where he lives. Right? And how does the author begin? Strive for peace with everyone. Are you doing that? Holiness takes effort. You doing that? Because you know the message of the world is division. That's the message of the world. It's always been the message of the world. Division. The message of the Lord is unity. And anyone who turns brother against brother or brother against sister, anyone who name calls, anyone who blames the other side, anyone who draws a line in the sand, anyone who wears one team jersey and says, our team is the best and the other team is terrible, that is a surefire prover that they are not from the Lord. Division is not holy. It is not godly. It is not Christian. Holiness is striving for peace with all people. Because we are all his children. Remember point number two? Holiness is about God. It is about God. And just like a parent who is proud when we take our first steps, parents are also most proud when their children get along. Part of the pursuance of holiness is recognizing that we are all his children. I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I want to know God. I want to pursue God. And I want to see his will. And I want to be a child of God. And I want to be working with God. Walking with God. So I need to pursue holiness. It takes effort. And that is all that matters. Right? That's all that matters. Tell me something that matters more. Go on. Anything. Tell me something that matters more. What else matters more? In the grand scheme of all that is important in life, what else matters more? Anything? 2 Timothy 2 says, Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he'll be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. I want to be all of those things. (laughs) I want to be all of those things. I want to be a vessel for honorable use. I want to be set apart. I want to be holy. I want to be useful for the master. I want to be ready for good works. What else in life matters? Nothing. Paul says, cleanse yourself from what is dishonorable. Are we understanding holiness just a little bit better? 
You know, when God was forging his relationship with the Israelites, he told Moses, he said, give the following instruction to everyone in the community. And he says, you must be holy because I am holy. God was calling his people to a relationship, to himself. The Bible is a love letter. And God wanted his people not just to survive in the desert, but he also wanted them at the same time to grow closer to him, to walk with him, to seek his face, to know his will. And for that to happen, they had to come to him on his terms, not theirs, not the world's. Holiness means turning away from the world and becoming who you really are, a child of God, a child of God taking effort, <laughs> making steps towards him. It means renewing my mind. It means cleansing myself from all that is worldly. It means turning toward him. It takes effort. And then following his perfect will, being holy because he is holy. Be holy because he is holy. Let's pray together. Lord, there is nothing I want more than to seek your face, to know your will, to be like your son who came as our perfect example who is 100% human and yet never sinned, pursued you with all he was. Jesus was a savior who loved both Jew and Gentile. Jesus was a savior who healed the Romans. He healed the sick. He healed the broken. Lord, as your church, you have called us to continue the work of your Son. And for that to happen, we need to be holy. Not puffed up, not arrogant, not pursuing vanity, but pursuing you. Not for a halo, but for a crown. Lord, help me to see my neighbor as my brother and sister and help me to love my enemies as I do myself. Help my hands and feet to be instruments of healing, instruments of love, and instruments of grace. Help me to put aside my own pride and to do whatever it takes to strive for peace, first in my own family, First, within the people that you have given me, if there are people in my own family where their bridge has been burned, Lord, then make me a builder of bridges. Whatever it takes to strive for peace with everyone. And then, Lord, in my community, help me to be neighbor and friend. If there is anything I can do for those that live around me, any way I can serve or spread the gospel, Lord, help my feet to be instruments of peace. Help my hands to work and to build and to mend. And may I renew my mind. May I flush out the message of this world, its message of hate, its message of conflict, its message of war, its message of division. Help me to see all people, whether across the table or across the world, as brother, as sister, as kin, as neighbor. May I pray for peace. Peace everywhere, peace in all. May we learn to love each other and to put you first in all things. 
there is no greater pursuit than to pursue your teaching, your will, your holiness. Amen. Thank you for coming out and worshiping with us today. Thanks for being here. Uh, we got two services every single Sunday, one at 9.30. That's our traditional service. We have a choir. We're going to sing all your favorite hymns. We're going to say the Lord's Prayer. We're going to have communion. We're going to do responsive readings. It's going to be church just like you remember. And we have a service at 11 o'clock. That is our contemporary service. Come casual. Come however you feel best. Uh, we've got a full children's program from birth all the way through high school. And we would love to be the church where you live. Thanks, guys. I'll see you next week. Bye.